Welcome to Room 101. My guest tonight is a Turner Prize nominee who has gone on to become one of the best-known artists in the country. Will you please welcome Tracy Emin? Hi, <laughs> right, Tracy. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Take a seat. So, first of all, a very warm welcome to Room 101. Um, you have a reputation for, for speaking your mind. Uh, did that make it easy when you were coming up for choices for Room 101? No, it actually made it quite difficult, because uh -huh. if I was hardcore, I would have things like Rebecca Lou's Sweden. But, um, <laughs> what have you got against Sweden? I'm not racist, so it's very difficult for me to say. But the fact that they... Uh, had compulsory sterilisation until 1975. But that was just for milk, though, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> compulsory sterilisation until what? What for everybody? No, obviously, I was. There would be no pe no people in Sweden. Well, that's what I was thinking. Look, <laughs> I want to stick to the positive. Okay, we'll stick negative. to the okay. We'll stick to the ones that you have chosen. Then let's take a look at your first choice, amply illustrated by this. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life to our Lord Jesus. <laughs> so, what does this represent? <clears throat> drunk. Being drunk. Yes. Okay. And is it just anybody being drunk? No, nope, people can do whatever they like. It's yeah. me being drunk. You being drunk. Yeah. How often do you get drunk? More than I should. Mm. And this week, maybe three or four times. Do you like the feeling of being drunk when you are drunk? I love the feeling of getting there, yeah. on the way, yeah. moving towards it, and then something twists. And I don't drink spirits anymore. I haven't drank spirits since 1999. Uh -huh. I just drink white wine and champagne. Uh -huh. And actually, I get drunk on just maybe one bottle. That's all it takes now. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad. That is very sad, isn't it? I know. It? It's not the hardcore kind of rock and roll image that people expect. But the thing is, when, as, you, as you do get older, your ability to get over hangovers, it, hangovers suddenly instead of them being like a sort of half a morning or a day they become sometimes two days my hangovers aren't that bad because like, it's only white wine uh -huh. you know uh -huh. it's more like the bit between me having fun and then the, mi the bit of me trying to place call people what happened the blackouts as i like to refer to right them. and is that quite frightening sometimes yeah and really embarrassing totally could you share with us some of the most embarrassing things <laughs> well i was in rome last week you do in rome as the romans do yeah Apparently, I sim simulated anal sex with a bollard, for yeah. one. <laughs> well, the <laughs> Romans are known for that. <laughs> would, would you call yourself a binge drinker, do you think? Have you, have you ever had a whole bottle of binge in one go? Well, what I've done... <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a pint of binge, please. <laughs> but, oh, that sounds... Binge, it's a pretty disgusting word when you think of yes, it. Yes, yes. Rhymes with... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing it out to me, yeah. otherwise I would have been wandering in a world of ignorance. <laughs> Do you, mind, um, do you mind other people being drunk, then? It is great to have a few drinks and be merry and just let, you know, get rid of a few inhibitions. But mm. most people know I don't have many inhibitions. Uh -huh. So, for me, it goes to an extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at you a little bit pissed. It's a few years ago now, but here we are on a, a Channel 4 show, I think it is. I'm the artist here from, from that show, from the station. I'm here. I'm drunk. I had a good night out with my friends. I'm leaving now. I'm going to be with my friends. I'm going to be with my mum. I'm going to phone her. And she's going to be embarrassed about this conversation. <laughs> it's live. But I don't care. I think you're a fuck about it. There's no one with this fucking mic on me. On, now, I want to it off. I want to be free. Don't you understand? <clears throat> well, there's a great painting. Bye, there's a great painting. Bye, of, Tracy. Of Turner Storms. <laughs> there is an explanation there, though, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> You've been drinking alcohol? Yeah. yeah. But it was something else as well. You know, your hand was injured. What had happened there? Um, <clears throat> I'd, we had been in New York a couple mm. of days before, and so it was really cold. November evening, I was outside smoking a cigarette. <laughs> like this, and I was, ooh. And then for some kind of bit of entertainment, I decided to pretend I was a pony. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was stone and sober that night. Yeah. And as I went, nay. I mm. fell like this and then smashed the whole of my hand up with all my diamond rings 
and this was before bling was in. I was way ahead of my time, I can assure you. And I then carried on. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I stayed up all night in New York. I went shopping the next morning, and it was only when I was signing the credit card thing, I was like, this is really weird. And my finger just had like a giant grey ping pong ball, and it was just completely dead like this, and grey the nail. And I thought, oh, I'd better hurry up. I've got to get my flight home, go to the airport. And as I'm queuing, I thought, hmm, upgrade. So I showed them my hands, hoping they'd upgrade me. And of course they didn't, they called an ambulance straight away. Mm. Ended up in... Well, that's not an upgrade if you're hoping to get on the yeah, plane, yeah, is it? <laughs> and I get to the hospital and they couldn't get the ring off my finger. And the finger was so dead by then that the possibility was amputation. Oh my God. And, and they eventually got the ring off. The hospital said, had I got on, this is brilliant, on the plane with the ring on my finger, mm -hmm. with like that, one or two things would have happened. Either A, I would, my finger would have exploded on the plane. <laughs> light airplane entertainment. Mm. <laughs> or B, as soon as I got to England, I would have had to have had my finger amputated. So during that bit there, you were on very powerful painkillers, weren't you? I was you? on really, yes, it was prescribed drugs. <laughs> I was on really strong painkillers. My friend, Gillian, uh, had just won the Turner Prize that year. So I was ecstatically happy. Mm. I was really on a major high about the whole night, except I had to do this really boring TV thing. Did people tell you when you got home that you'd been on telly? Or well, I didn't know, you see, because there was a part, this really, I'll try and make this really simple. There was a party mm -hmm. that started at 11, and I had to do the TV thing. So I, could, I would get to the party late. Mm -hmm. But because I stormed off of the TV thing only after five minutes, and I had a limousine car waiting for me outside. I got to the party the same time as all my friends. Which is good news. Yeah, it's great. I got to see my friends and I think I did phone my mum. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then, and so I just carried on to the party. And in the morning, Gillian Waring rings me up. She won the Turner Prize. And she said, Trace, my highlight of the whole thing wasn't just winning, but it was you on telly last night. You were so hilarious. Da -da -da -da. I think, what? And I go out and it's like some Kafka moment. I look at the Guardian and there I am in all my glory with my finger drunk and this is the first I know about it and I said to my boyfriend at the time, I said, I didn't do that TV thing last night. He said, no, of course not. You were with us. And everyone was going... <laughs> <laughs> so so I, was, I was thinking, God, what? And I was thinking, and also gillian has got a wicked sense of humour, so I thought it was a really witty thing of her to say yeah. until Nick Sirota from the Tate Gallery rang me. You and know. what did he say? He reassured me that I'm an artist and I have integrity and not to worry about it, which was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Some people get an appeal on television completely pissed and you'd never know it. You'd never know it. Have a look at this. But you couldn't do my job because you are dyslexic. <laughs> True or false? <laughs> Jerry, give me some job music. Give me some job music. Ken, give me some job music and I'll see you without this thing. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> that is the most extraordinary response I've ever seen to anybody being asked, are you dyslexic? <laughs> Well, I think this has definitely got to go into room 101 because like, otherwise we'd be condemning you to years and years of drinking and you don't want to drink it. So definitely, Tracy being drunk, going into room 101. Bye bye. <laughs> Excellent. Let's have a look at your next choice, uh, amply illustrated by this. There we are. We have a, a silver uh, tray there, some money in it. Thank you. What is this all about? Tipping. What is, what's it about tipping you don't like? We all know how to tip, we yeah. all know when we're supposed to tip. But even if you're an educated tipper, it still gets complicated. Uh -huh. There's the 10%, there's the service included, there's the really filthy look when you just round it off to, to the pound, uh -huh. to a taxi driver yeah. or whatever. And it causes like kind of friction at the end of a meal as well. There's always the tipping conversation. How does uh, the tipping conversation go? Um, is service included? Mm -hmm. uh, Shall we give them a tip then? No, service is included. Yeah, but they were really nice waitress. We should tip them anyway. But then they were... Uh. <laughs> you could do what Picasso did, of course. Picasso famously never paid for a meal, did he? would go into the restaurant and, you know, he'd sell one of his drawings. It's like, here's four Mexicans pissing into a bottle. I'll have the fish cakes. <laughs> give it to the waiter. <laughs> so, you, you mean, you studied fine art. You, you got it first, so you, you must be very good at drawing. Have you ever been tempted to do this? Leave it as a tip, do a little drawing at the end? No, I never have actually, because my drawing inevitably is going to be worth a lot more than the um, 
from the mirror. <laughs> well, what if it was like a tiny drawing? A picture of a horse looking out the window. <laughs> Would that be worth a lot of money? Well, it depends how much someone valued it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, can I tempt you into doing a drawing now? Of a tiny horse looking out of a window. Would you? OK. <laughs> a tiny horse looking out of a window. There we are. I'll give you that. Oh, no. Window. Yeah. <laughs> There's some trees. Yeah. Okay. Oh dear. Oh no. It looks like a moomin papa. Looks like a what? Moomin papa. Well, do a moomin papa looking out the window. <laughs> There you are. OK. That's, you. That's not bad. That's very good. I'll show you. Can you sign it for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be worth liver, bacon, onion, chips and peas, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, when I go into a restaurant, if I draw on a tablecloth, they find me ten quid. Uh, <laughs> what other people do you always tip, then? I, um, I tip taxi drivers. Taxi drivers, I tip right... So if it's like six pound twenty, I make it seven pound. I always round it up uh -huh. to nearest pound uh -huh. because I don't want to be I don't want to be perceived as being a mean person mm -hmm. because I didn't give the taxi driver that Tracy and because she's mean. Yeah, I don't want to be perceived like that. There's a thing that Tommy Cooper used to do when he used to get taxis. He'd sort of get out of the cab and he'd sort of put something into their top pocket, have a drink on me, and when they looked, at it was a tea bag. <laughs> So when you're drunk in a taxi, do you, do you feel like you have to overcompensate? Oh, no, this is, no, this is, I don't want to go back to the drunk thing, but this is really, overcompensate. Mm. In Berlin, when yeah. I did projectile vomit on the back of the taxi driver's yeah. neck, <laughs> did I have to overcompensate? On the back of his neck? <laughs> yes. And my boyfriend at the time said it was like the exorcist <laughs> at the Brandenburg Gate. So it just, just sort of, just went, did it? And I, it just went, <laughs> like that, all across the window, all the way around, everything. And another time, this is really disgusting, okay, I had a parker, you know a parker that's fur-lined inside? Yeah. Okay, and the taxi driver wouldn't stop, because I think he thought I was a prostitute and I was going to do a runner or something. And I really wanted him to stop so I could just throw up, and this is years ago, and I had, I took, had to take my, I was so drunk, take my arm out my sleeve, hold the end of the sleeve and... <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw it away. I'm sure you did, but yeah. bury it somewhere. Yeah. Um, is it a working class thing? Do you hate people doing things for you? Or do you get nervous about it? Or is it just the fact that, OK, he's picked my bag up from the lobby now, the other guy's taking me into the lift now, somebody else is showing me the room, and I've got to tip all these people? Yeah, there's, there's always different rules and permutations, and it becomes complicated. Uh, I'm not going to put tipping into room 101, because, um, I mean, what would happen the next time I, I, you know, I went for a haircut or got a taxi or, or ate in a restaurant? There'd be no tipping. People would look at me, there's the guy that got rid of tipping. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be sitting there like Captain Muggins. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Captain Muggins. So I, I, can't put, I can't put tipping into room one. So I'm sorry, right. Trace. You're going to have to take tipping home with you. Tipping okay. can't go in. So you just bung it next to you there.